Great. Let's do it. All right. So today we're talking about planning for change. We know rivers move. So let's talk about what it means to plan around that. We have a love hate relationship with rivers. We'll start with the love. That's kind of mostly what this class is oriented around, right? The recreating on them, being near them, living near them. Here is a house that's very nicely um, cozied up to that meander right there. Uh, I think this is out somewhere in the South Park area. And here is uh, another home. I think this might be um, Salaya. Condos going up right on the river. Um, we love that. We want to be close. It's like my puppy's one years old. Uh, he's a pound pup, and he's like just. I think he didn't get a lot of love in the first part of his life, and so he's just right there with you, wherever you go. So we like to kind of cozy up. Um, but this can be problematic, as we know, because rivers move, especially during floods. And here's just some examples. Recently, the 2013 flood. This is SS Park. Um, we had a condo development go right up on the banks of the river. That was destroyed. Uh, similar situation. This is uh, Monument Creek outside of uh, Colorado Springs, a 1937 flood. So we have a, a long history of being too close to rivers and kind of getting bitten by being too close to rivers, right? Um, but just like a family, we have to learn how to live together. And it can get complicated. We've got the Gunnison coming in. Got the Colorado, this is the Fifth Street Bridge. Um, here's that Riverside Park in Las Colonias. And there's just so much going on. We've got the river itself, right? Endangered fish habitat, a water park, a boat launch. And we start to get into the infrastructure, a really important bridge. Um, we have an armored bank right here, uh, redevelopment happening. This is the habitat that's been constructed. Uh, Trent Paul talked about it in the lecture. There's a levee system. All of these things are have to kind of work together, hopefully harmoniously. And here's that Riverside community. Uh, this is where Dos Rios is going in, and then the Riverside community that is in the 100-year flood plain. We can think of rivers as cross sections as well, where we have kind of the base flow and the channel. Um, and then as we get higher and higher kind of floods or less and less frequent floods, we'll talk about return interval in a second. Um, but the idea is the higher the return interval, the more intense or big the flood is. We get different levels. So we could have, you know, riparian zone here. Ideally, our development is kind of higher up and less prone to flooding. Um, but there's a lot of different ecological things that could be happening in these different zones. And different managers or different purviews. So our fish biologists are really interested in what's happening in this main channel, the base flow channel. Water quality as well, right? We've got runoff coming from our creeks. So we've got, um, you know, sewage discharges that, you know, from the sewer plant that's, that's cleaned up. Um, but all that is important and affects the water quality, especially at base flows. As we get up, we start to get into landowner rights, right? Um, we get the riparian zone where our plants are. We start to get property, private property boundaries. Maybe we have some open space, parks, that sort of thing. And then in this bigger footprint now, we're thinking about our floodplain managers, those that um, issue permits, um, make sure development is above the 100 year floodplain, et cetera. So we'll remember that the river is not just a channel, it's a corridor that can stretch from one side of the valley to the next. And all of this is kind of in play when it comes to um, thinking about the river, managing for the river, and also the hazards associated with the river. Of course, we know that the river corridor is dynamic, it moves over time. This is that image we saw of the Gunnison moving from 1955 to 2015. And dynamic rivers are functioning ecosystems. Here is a Yampa River that is um, slowly eroding its bank and it's building out this floodplain. Um, and as we build, you can kind of see these like scroll marks. As we build this out, we get this succession of vegetation. Um, is anyone studying environmental science or uh, biology or anything like that? Um, as we get succession, we 
we, we kind of get old trees, cottonwood trees, and young trees over here. And uh, this kind of complex of young and old is really important ecologically. Um, certain you know, birds and animals live in these older forests, and other ones live in these younger ones. And that type of complexity is sustained by this migration over time. So here's some young cottonwoods on the Yampa um, sprouting from the previous year's flood. So because of that dynamism, we know it, we also have this hazard. We've talked about that a little bit already. Here is a bike path that was unfortunately washed away a little bit too close to the river. Um, this is uh, on the front range in 2013 flood. So when we think about river corridor management, we're thinking about a lot of things. We talked about ecosystems. We're gonna talk about flood safety. We're gonna make sure that our private and public assets are protected and gonna be working for us in the long run. Our bridges don't get washed out. Our bike path doesn't get washed out. Our properties aren't damaged, right? Our homes. Um, and ultimately this means thinking about where we can make room for the river. So we'll, we'll talk about why it's important to plan for change. We will look at some tools and a framework for how we can approach planning for change in river corridors. And then see an example of what this can look like. At the end, we'll have you guys do an exercise where you will come up with your own plan for a proposed development on the river in town. So let's zoom in. We're on the Colorado River here in town. Um, Walmart's right here. This is the Rimrock Shopping Center. Connected Lakes is right here. Actually, Connected Lakes is right here. Um, and we also have this bike path. So here's the uh, highway business loop highway right here. So zooming in, we've got outside of a meander bend, which way do rivers move when they're migrating? Are they going to move this way or this way? Yeah. Um, so in 2018, here's our bike path. Not a lot of room right there between the path and the river. We had a really big snow year, a pretty decent runoff. Um, was anyone here for that? Kind of ran and ran and ran and ran. Um, and it didn't come down for a really long time. It was beautiful. Um, we have a student who got on a paddleboard with her friends and did the Ruby Horse Thief um, float, which we're doing next weekend. So I think Don will talk about that fall break weekend. Um, she did it in like four hours from, from Loma all the way down to, to Whitewater, which we'll do in about two days. So that flow, of course, the road of the bank, it wasn't dramatic, right? But maybe it took out, I don't know, 20, 30 feet of the bank. And that's the bike path that now is in the river. Not surprising, but um, nevertheless, we have to deal with that. This was rebuilt. The city determined that this was a battle they wanted to, to pick, right? They had an underground utility there, and they also permitted development right up to the edge of this bike path. So this is a storage unit system. That's right there. So planning for change, let's talk about that. Here's an example of um, the 2013 flood through Longmont. This is Left Hand Creek. Um, it's going through a channelized reach that goes through neighborhoods. So back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, we would take rivers and channelize them, um, put them in a kind of a straight jacket essentially. So really narrow, steep, fast moving water really effective at moving water away from this area and getting it downstream. But what happens downstream when the channelization stops? Things blow up. And so this is a park. This wasn't as channelized. And you know, eventually you kind of think of this as riprap. We riprap both sides of the river. Um, eventually that river, that energy that the river accumulates as it kind of accelerates through this you know, highway essentially, it has to be expended somewhere. And so this is where a bunch of erosion happens as a result of this acceleration. Um, so rip wrapping might protect you locally, but eventually you're kind of passing the buck downstream in terms of the risk of energy of this water. All right, so we saw this slide, I'm gonna show it again. Um, we want to rip wrap stuff and keep things from moving. And often that might be a necessary thing to do for a particular location. Um, so here's our little stream and here's our stormwater um, 
public works department coming in with a riprap. Um, but eventually, like we saw in the park or these paths, the streams will will destroy that riprap. It's not 100 percent inevitable. You can design really beefy rocks, right? But um, it's always going to be a maintenance issue. So what I'm arguing is let's find a balance for our urban streams. Let's find locations where we can let them roam free in the woods and be wild, little animals. Um, here's an example. We'll talk about Sand Creek outside of Denver. And this is an open space, right? You can see the river is kind of in its natural character. It's got many channels. It's very graded. There's a lot of trees. And there's some space for this river. Uh, but just upstream, we have the channelized reach. Very similar to Longmont. Fortunately, this channelized reach empties in this area. So this is a great location to expend that energy. Um, and obviously, we're going to have some control of our rivers in town. So what does this look like for Grand Junction? Um, we'll, we'll get to kind of think about that as we, as we go along here. So I'll, I'll walk through a decision tree kind of tool for managing infrastructure developments in the river corridor. And this is based off of a document I got to work on when I was with the Bureau of Reclamation. And we start off with thinking about what, what are we trying to do here? What's our project goals? What's the scope? And are we, um, we, we got to hear about Dos Rios, for example, right, from Jen Taylor. And she had all this vision about what she wanted for that development. She wanted people connected with the bike trail, connected with the river that had this like space that's outside and kind of flowy and a lot of like energy moving around. Um, so how does that fit in with the site itself, with the location of where we're building? Um, is there a master plan? And a master plan um, can have many scales. She showed us a plan of that site. We're gonna have condos here, we're gonna have a restaurant here, we're gonna have uh, townhomes here, right? That's a master plan for a site. We could do that for a whole river corridor. We can say, okay, here's where we focus um, residential development. Here's where we wanna focus commercial recreation. Here's where we have some sensitive habitat that we wanna conserve and restore. Um, and that plan is something that can then guide where we do development and where we don't do development. Um, so having a master plan can be really helpful in a river corridor because we're not gonna do everything ad hoc like one by one, and then we kind of look up and we're like, oh crap, this isn't what we wanted, right? Um, ideally that master plan thinks about stream processes. And we'll talk about fluvial hazard zone mapping. We introduced that concept, but that is basically a map that identifies where is the river likely to move and inhabit over time. So this is the first, first thing we'll talk about, then we'll kind of get into these next steps. So, Planning for change means making a plan, a master plan. Um, this isn't something that's like required. There's no law that says every urban stream corridor has to have a master plan. Ideally it does because they're complicated things and they're connected, right? Palisade down to Fruta, three different municipalities, the county, the federal governments. It's a whole hodgepodge and none of them necessarily talk to each other. So a stream corridor master plan might think of legacy impacts. Do we have that channelization? Do we have those that old riprap, the cars, we have the you know, uranium tailings, right? What infrastructure is in place? What new development do we have planned? Do we need to improve anything? Is that bridge too narrow and confining the river? Is that bridge gonna be taken out the next flood that we have? Um, where do we need to go and enhance things? Does, do we need to build a little levee for the uh, riverside community? Um, how long is that gonna take? What's that gonna look like? And then we have what we call, so a lot of that is kind of gray infrastructure. Gray means concrete, bridges, roads, riprap. We also have green infrastructure. And we'll think about what that means in a second. Um, where do we want open space? What are our transportation corridors? And where, how do we want the community to connect with the river? Do we have opportunities to connect? Does every neighborhood along the river have access in a way that's meaningful for them? So we know that we have really good access in town with the new riverfront development uh, that we're talking about, but that doesn't exist everywhere. So what does that look like up and down the river? 
So let's think of um, green infrastructure. So green infrastructure, I think we can all assume that this means something that's natural, something that's growing, something that is a, something that an engineer built, right? Versus gray infrastructure. Um, and what I haven't really spent much time introducing this concept, but I want you to kind of use your imagination to think about what could green infrastructure look like on the Colorado River or in any kind of river corridor. So gray infrastructure, we have the levee, right? We have rib wrap, we have a bike path, a dam, something like that. What would green infrastructure look like? Something that serves a purpose for humans, um, but is something that comes out of our environment, out of the natural river environment. Take a minute to think about that and um, we'll take a, a minute to chat with your neighbor. What's an example of, of green infrastructure, natural infrastructure? Yeah. Yeah. How does that? What is that serving? What kind of infrastructure-like thing is that doing? Do you guys remember that that image that we saw with Carol's presentation? Was it last week? Of this kind of park-like setting. Um, they had a bridge. It was like open space, and then it flooded. Right. How did that serve as infrastructure? That area. Yeah, like it, it didn't get destroyed, right? We, when we think of infrastructure, we want something that like is there and then if something bad happens or a flood happens or whatever, like it, it serves a function. In that case, maybe it slowed water down, maybe it trapped sediment. It didn't destroy the near, you know, allowed the near nearby infrastructure and downstream infrastructure not get destroyed because it, it was a flood plant. It served as kind of flood storage and transport. If that were just a concrete line thing like the LA Channel, the LA River, um, then the flood would be ripping through. A, that would be super expensive. B, the flood would be ripping through and then it's going to blow up something downstream, right? So we kind of had, had that green infrastructure, natural infrastructure to slow things down. How about another example? Really, it's just allowing um, nature to do what nature does. Where we don't have concrete, water infiltrates into the soil. We don't get as much stormwater runoff. Um, we don't get the chemicals coming off of you know, development from cars and metals and air, de air deposition. Um, trees also on the riverbanks slow down riverbank erosion. Often they're used specifically to halt uh, riverbank erosion. So there's, there's a lot of other, how about let's get one more. Let's get one more example. All right. Yeah. What does that do? Yeah. Um, green infrastructure specifically, um, there's kind of two things. There's green and then there's natural green. I'm kind of using them interchangeably here because that's okay. Um, green infrastructure is typically related to stormwater. So allowing rainfall to go into a vegetated area instead of just a pipe, right, that goes to a pond or the river. And that natural area will allow the water to infiltrate into the soil, like it did before you know, we built the city. Um, so looking for opportunities to bring nature in, green infrastructure could be um, just a tree canopy that keeps the city cooler, right? There's a lot of things that that I can do. So here's 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 a graphic that's maybe it's a little bit hard to read. Shows you all the ways that we can incorporate green and natural infrastructure um, into our systems for water. And of course, connecting rivers to the floodplains is something that we're interested in in this class. Um, flood bypasses. We talked about that in the city in this class earlier. Restoring wetlands to soak up water and, and attenuate floods over time. So all these things can serve really important um, functions. And 
ideally it's not as expensive, right? Building a big stormwater pond or dam for flooding might be really expensive versus thinking about restoring, maybe you have to restore thousands of acres of wetland or something like that upstream, but it could potentially serve the same function. So stream corridor master planning um, incorporates dynamism, hazards, and incorporates um, green spaces. And often a, a, a kind of management paradigm that we use in urban environments is called the string of pearls. Has anyone heard this phrase before? String of pearls is the idea that we have a river, there's a stream. Um, so here's a pearl necklace. And the pearls are these natural areas. They're not continuous necessarily, but they're attached by the river. And so maybe we have a little park here, we have a natural open space here, and these are pearls along the stream. Because we know that we have an urban environment, we're not going to have this continuous, you know, green urban or river corridor um, that's going to be, you know, perfectly intact. Does the Colorado River have follow the string of pearls concept? I don't know how familiar everyone is with the, the whole Grand Valley here. Is that is that some concept that you think applies to our river? How does that play out here? We have the stream, here's the river. So we do have some pearls. So you see a lot of ag right here. This is a lot of the green, um, but we do have parks and there's gonna be some parks up along here. There's the state park system, the James M. Robinson state park system. And so those pearls are pretty few and far between. We have one up here at Island Acres. We've got um, Corn Lake, um, Connected Lakes, right? And Fruita. So those are some pearls. Um, I think we, to look for opportunities to add some more pearls to this stream. Uh, the Clifton Natural Area, somewhere around here. All right, very kind of loose introduction to master planning. Carol fortunately covered a lot of the other concepts that you wanna have in a master plan, right? The community values, transportation, equity, right? Who's connected, who's not connected to the river, uh, the hazards she talked about, the uh, habitat values. So all those things go together. Um, we do need to think about hazards specifically. So let's take a few minutes to talk about how hazards play a role in managing river corridors. The first hazard we'll talk about is mapping the floodplain. And this is essentially an exercise, an engineering exercise to delineate the corridor, to map the corridor that would get wet during a flood. But there's a lot that kind of goes into that, right? Here's just a footprint. We've got a um, certain floodplain here. We've got a little more extreme floodplain in green. We've got this kind of narrow corridor known as the floodway. Um, but what goes into this? So let's talk about that. So one definition of the floodplain is the, what we call 100 year floodplain. Another way to think about that is the 1% annual chance flood. And we'll, we'll get into some statistics in a second. Um, this is a bit of a misnomer. It's easier to say, it's easier for our brains to wrap our heads around it. But this is a little more statistically sound. It means that we have a 1% chance of experiencing this flood every year. So the floodplain, um, we can think about either as this corridor or as this cross section. In the middle, we have what's known as the flood wave. This is a special zone where development is really severely restricted. But we heard about how they're filling the floodplain to raise it up, raise development up within the floodplain so that it's above it, so it doesn't get wet. Um, the flood way is, I think I'm going to define this in a second. Yeah, okay. We'll get to that in a second. Let's, let's dig into what the 100-year floodplain means. Does it mean one flood every 100 years? Glad to see Vera <laughs> shaking her head. Um, no, it doesn't. It, that's often a misnomer, often a kind of misconception that we have. In Houston, they were having back-to-back, -back, or maybe every two to three years, typically from hurricanes and tropical storms. 
How many of your floods? They had a, a record on a stream gauge that went back maybe 50 years. They did some statistics on it, came up with this estimate of what the 100 year or 1% annual chance flood would be. But they were getting them so often. What's going on? Climate change probably plays a role in it, but we also have a core data series that is trying to find something that's really extreme and really rare. It doesn't mean that it ha happens once every 100 years. 100 years is what's called a recurrence interval. A recurrence interval is, you can even think of it this way. If we had a sample, if we had a stream gauge on the river and we're measuring the maximum flood that came through, the maximum flow rate of cubic feet per second, Every year. So we get one point one year, another point the next year, another point the next year. And we did that for 10,000 years. Of course, we don't have these, these records, right? The Neanderthals didn't keep stream gauges, unfortunately. Um, but if we had that record, we would expect that the flood of this magnitude, this big flood, would happen about once every 100 years, on average, over that 10,000 year record, the interval in between that big flood event. Each year, there's some different flood event, but that, that 100 year flood event. So that's what recurrence interval is. It's just on average, what is the average time between? But we only live on this planet for less than 100 years. And so we might see more than one of these in a given year. It's just a probability thing. So if we take the reciprocal of that one over 100, one over the recurrence interval, we get the annual probability. So one over the recurrence interval gives us 0.01 or 1%. And this is then interpreted as the probability each year of experiencing this flood event. So it can add up 1% chance of occurring in a given year. Write this down, it's on the course. Okay, and we'll look at how this plays out uh, with probability um, over time. So another way to think about this 1% flood, 1% annual chance flood is um, gumballs. So we'll do a, a simple probability exercise here. We've got a nice big bowl of gumballs and there's hundred of them. 99 are blue and one is red. This is our flood. So what's the chance of picking that red one out if I close my eyes? 0 0.01, 1%, right? So close your eyes, grab a gumball. Is it the red one? Did I pick it? No, okay. Put it back in. That's important that I put it back in because each time is an independent sample. Each year is independent of the next. That's not totally true, but we usually assume that. Um, and each year I have an equal probability of seeing the flood event. So I put it back in, close my eyes, grab another one. Got lucky again, put it back in. Uh, there was one point, okay, I didn't include this. So if you do the math on the probability of this, um, there is about a 26% chance of experiencing a 100 year flood over 30 years. So if I build a house in the floodplain, I get a 30 year mortgage on it. My insurance, my flood insurance is going to know that probability. I have essentially um, a 26% chance of getting flooded if I'm right at the edge, right? If I'm closer, then maybe the percentage is a little bit greater. Um, so that probability each year accumulates a little bit. You don't just add it up, there's, it's a, there's an exponent. Anyway, we don't need to do that right now. So we have this regulatory definition of a floodplain. It's based on statistics. Um, we have the floodway, we have the fringe. This whole area is the 100 year floodplain. But this flood way is defined as the zone. If you were to fill in the, um, if you were basically to fill in the whole floodplain and kind of squish it up, how far do you have to go to get to raise the water one foot in the flood way? So that's how they define it. It's this kind of hydraulic type of exercise. This is much more highly regulated. It's not very hard to fill the floodplain in. What happens when we fill the floodplain in? What happens to the flood maybe nearby or downstream? How high would that water be? If I go in and put in a thousand cubic yards or whatever of material and fill in so many acres, 
What do you think that's going to do to the flood water somewhere else? What's that? Raise it. Yeah, it's going to probably raise it. <laughs> and if we did it everywhere, you know, we'd raise it. But the kind of thing that people will fall back on is well, we still have this floodway, and we know that this is the zone that we can fill into, and things will only raise one foot. So you've got this you know, plus or minus one foot of uncertainty to deal with. So often, one of the floodplain management practices we do is filling the floodplain so that everything's raised above it. I don't think that's good practice, but that's just the reality of um, regulations and, and what we do with floodplains. So is it legal to fill the floodplain? Yeah, you'd have to pay money. <laughs> you have to do an engineer to do a study. You have to pay some more money to do some permitting. Um, typically, it's not, It's uh, this is much more highly regulated. Typically, it's a lot harder to fill in the floodway. But it's not totally impossible. All right, so who regulates floodplains? Is it the Clean Water Act? Army Corps of Engineers? Um, well, we start off with FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, and why do they regulate it? Well, because floods are disasters and we have emergencies, typically when floods happen because people live in a floodplain. Um, so it falls under this agency um, and the National Flood Insurance Program, which is managed by FEMA. We have a national flood insurance program because private insurers typically don't want to insure your home if you're in the floodplain or near flood hazards. It's expensive. They don't want that liability. So the federal government stepped in to essentially um, subsidize flood insurance. The program was going to be amended and that subsidy drastically reduced uh, many years ago during the Obama administration. And people's premiums, their flood insurance premiums, especially in coastal areas, were going to be going up by five, ten times. Maybe they paid four thousand a year or something like that for flood insurance. It was going to go up to twenty thousand. Everyone freaked out, and they took a step back. And we still subsidize to a great amount. Um, but the flood insurance program basically subsidizes and allows people to live in the flood. Um, I'm not saying that. It's a bad thing, right? Because we have trillions of dollars of infrastructure and homes in, in floodplains. So we need to um, have a system that supports people when there's a disaster. Uh, but we won't get into all the politics and uh, complexities of that, right? Say someone gets their home flooded, they rebuild with the flood insurance program, and then 10 years later, it gets flooded again. There's these chronic flooding zones, and there are buyout programs. That would pay market value and buy the home, which would be cheaper than just giving you the insurance money every year. But we can't force people to, to leave their homes typically. It's, it's something that has to be voluntary. So a little bit on the flood insurance program, but really there's no FEMA doesn't regulate. It comes down to individual states, right? And then um, our water conservation board. Um, we have to have um, <laughs> we're gonna call you out just because. <laughs> Uh, Kevin Houck is the uh, big floodplain person. Okay, lead floodplain manager for the state. We have his daughter right here, Mira Houck. Um, so you're in celebrity uh, presence here, and uh, in my in my world at least. And um, the state still doesn't regulate though, not really, um, because it comes down to individual individual cities and counties. To um, FEMA will help make maps. Which we'll talk about in a second. They'll give you funding to make maps. The state administers the mapping program, but it comes down to individual cities and counties to regulate. And they don't have to. The floodplain isn't mapped everywhere, so it's it's all kind of mostly voluntary. There's some economic incentives involved in there. This is what floodplain mapping looks like under the hood. We have an inundation model. Um, this is a hydraulic model. These are cross sections of the river. That's what one of the cross sections might look like. Really exaggerated vertically. And we'll go out and survey this, either on a boat or with, you know, just a survey. And then we put water in it, kind of computer water. 
based on the statistics, right? What's that 100 year flood magnitude? What's that CFS? 10,000 CFS, we'll put it in. The model runs it through the river and we get this inundation surface. And then we drape that over topography in a map. And then we can map where the flood goes. How deep is the water? Um, we can think of it just as a binary. Are you in or out? Or we could also think of it as a probability. If you're here, you have a higher probability of getting flooded than over here, right? It can be a continuum. It's all based off of hydraulic model and hydrologic statistics. Here's what it looks like in Colorado, or sorry, uh, the Grand, Grand Valley in town. This is our floodway. Here's the flood plain. And do we have lost comments here? I can't remember. Yeah, butterfly. So that is in the 0.2% or 500 year floodplain. And so they, they did some filling right to make sure they're out. Here's a hundred year floodplain. And one of the things that Trent Paul talked about was diverting, right? They divert water from the river, but it comes back in the hundred year floodplain. So as long as water is diverted and returned within the same hundred year floodplain, it's not considered a water rights diversion. So they didn't have to deal with water rights. All right, so that's the kind of static engineer, FEMA, you know, insurance program floodplain map. But we also have a different way to think about floodplains, and that's via the lens of fluvial geomorphology. Fluvial refers to rivers or flow. Geomorphology, this is land. Morpho means shape, so the shape of the land formed by rivers. Fluvial geomorphology. Here's an image of fluvial geomorphology. This is a, a relative elevation model. So they kind of took the slope out of a, a map and made it flat. So the white is the deepest and then the green is the shallowest. And it shows how this river, this is in Washington, the Connaught River in Washington State, um, how it's moved over time. This is kind of meander scars and scrolls of this river as it moves over time, kind of ghostly. And it's showing that the river is dynamic and it moves. And so we want to think about that in terms of fluvial geomorphic hazards. So again, fluvial geomorphology and hazards. Hazards associated with river moving. Here's a definition um, that we developed for the state. The fluvial hazard zone is the area stream has occupied in recent history, may occupy in the future or may physically influence as it stores and transports water, sediment, and debris. So we're not just thinking of water now. The, the, the floodplain maps that we saw previously are just what would get wet. Now we're thinking about what can be influenced by water, sediment, debris, trees, right? Um, as the river moves. So it's not just erosion, but it could be deposition too. So here's an image of, I believe this is Drake on the Big Thompson River. And here was an original channel. Um, the river came over this way. We had another river coming in that way. We had a lot of sediment deposit outs. Um, it was quite a, quite a mess. So uh, uh, just a reintroduction of mapping the fluvial hazard zone. I introduced this a few weeks ago. The components of the fluvial hazard zone are the active stream corridor. You can think of this as the floodplain. The river is moving within that. Um, it could be meander migration within the active stream corridor. It could be finding a new route, a meander cutoff. Um, it could be depositing a bunch of sediment, making a new island, right? So the, the river could be very active over time in this corridor. Then we have this buffer. And the buffer gets at what the inundation mapping misses, what those FEMA maps, those just water inundation maps miss. I could be, um, here's, here's the river right here. Here's a nice uh, uh, loft terrace that I built my house on, but then the river erodes this away and then my house falls in the river. I would probably not have flood insurance because I'm you know, 30 feet above the river. It's never gonna get wet unless the river comes to me. Um, so what fluid hazard zone mapping does is identifies these areas that where you could be influenced by the river, like these homes right here, 
Um, but you might not know that just based on the theory maps alone, those, those flood plain maps alone. In Colorado, we have a lot of other ge ge geological features, geomorphic features. We have alluvial fans that come in. Those are kind of special. Uh, we have really steep slopes that could fall and break, and uh, we call those out as well. Um, just a, a little look at alluvial hazards on maps. So to dig in a little bit more, we have um, the active stream corridor. And so the, the real definition here is the land adjacent to a stream. So here's our stream. Here's the land adjacent to it. That has been shaped by erosion and deposition under the kind of current flow and sediment regimes. And the reason why we use this word prevailing just means that um, climate changes over the centuries and the eons, right? Um, 10,000 years ago, we had glaciers all over Colorado. We had different climates. Um, we had different sediment supply and flow regime. Um, and that changes over, over the time. So we're kind of thinking about the last um, 100 years or so, essentially. What does the flow regime look like? So we've delineated the active river corridor, active stream corridor right here. This is the South St. Green upstream of Lyons, Colorado. On Front Range, just north of Ward. And here's that same area after the 2013 flood. This is a particularly dramatic response to a flood. There's a bunch of canyons upstream, and those canyons are kind of like channelized reaches. They're really narrow, they're steep, a lot of sediments just kind of moving through, and then it gets to this wide, uh, shallower slope. And so all that sediment kind of drops out, and the river goes wide. But you can see how it occupied this active stream corridor pretty dramatically, shifting. Right, this was the channel right up here, and now it's down here, uh, kind of moving all over. So this is what we're trying to identify: is where is that channel moving, migrating over time? And here is how we would map this. This is a really high-resolution model of the terrain, digital elevation model. Um, based on LIDAR, which is a laser coming out of an airplane, and really high resolution. So we're able to actually look at this and kind of identify signatures um, of where the river has moved in influence. Obviously, this is after the flood event, so you can have some really fresh indication of, of where the river's been. But you might use this to identify, you know, meander scrolls or cutoffs or something like that. So we can kind of bound this region as the active stream corridor. The uh, fluvial hazard buffer is the land that's kind of next to the river that could be influenced, eroded. Um, and here's what it looks like on the Big Thompson. So this is an image after the flood where we had this buffer eroded. This is where the bank was before the flood. And here is where it is now over here. So we're trying to identify this zone so that we can tell these folks, you know what? Before you build your house, avoid that. If you already have your home built, get some flood insurance. Because <laughs> these, these folks probably didn't have it. Okay. So we bring all those things together to create, at a simple level, a map that shows where the river could be moving over time, and then what's that fringe that could be influenced, the buffer. A quick comparison between fluvial hazard maps and inundation maps or floodplain modeling maps. So floodplain modeling maps tell us what's going to get wet over time, where, and fluvial zone maps tell us where the river is going to move, what could influence it, um, where that road could get washed out, could you have a bunch of sediment fill up your, your home, which happened a lot on the front range, unfortunately. Let's take a look at the Colorado River. Um, I'm gonna put the shades down just so we can really, really see it. Take a minute to look at these images and tell me, do you see fluvial signatures? Here's a, a LiDAR image right here. A hill shade image of that area. Here's the same same picture, just um, <coughs> in black and white. 
So we can see this kind of gully coming in, right? This uh, little bit of a canyon. And you kind of see where it's flat and where it's not, right? This is kind of messy. You can kind of see little side channels and scrolls. This is pretty obvious, a big former um, meander bend that was cut off. And within that, you can kind of see a lot of texture, these, these signatures of past river presence or activity. Going back to the historic aerial imagery, we can kind of see what was there. This is from the 1930s, like 1937. Um, so this cutoff had happened fairly recently. And when we see these kind of signatures, like, well, the river was there, and you know, what's to keep it from going back there um, in 100 years or something like that? So this would be something where we would include in the active stream corridor. There it is today. Uh, we've levied it off a little bit with these ponds disconnecting. All right. Um, so we thought about hazards a little bit. Now let's think about consequences. Um, hazards are the things that can happen. The probability of something happening. Are we going to get flooded? Are we going to have uh, the river kind of take our bank out? But what happens? How bad is that, right? Like, how, how, what's the value of the home that's impacted? Or do we have threat to the life, right? Or is there like a school that could be wiped out in session or something like that? Like how much does it cost to maintain the infrastructure? So obviously threat to public safety is gonna be the first consequence we really care about. Do we, do we expect people to get harmed? And people do get harmed, unfortunately, in floods. We had the Black Hollow flood in the Poudre Canyon that happened this summer, killed four people. Um, that was a fire that happened there. And um, it rains, uh, fire burn, and then we had a huge flood that, and debris flow that um, harmed some people that were in that corridor. Then we think about property and infrastructure. Do we have some legal obligation to um, protect something? And then finally, like how much is it going to cost to maintain this infrastructure? Here's a paper um, by some folks out of CSU who looked at kind of a risk-based framework for managing wood in streams. Wood is naturally in streams. Um, we often take wood out because it can clog things up and kayakers don't like wood in streams. Um, but this gives folks, this is an example of how we can manage some dynamic, potentially hazardous aspects of the natural stream and not just make it, okay, every time we see wood in the stream, we're gonna take it out. Just kind of it gives you a risk analysis approach to managing wood and rivers. So a very basic definition of risk is probability times consequence. What's the probability? 1% in a given year, 26% over 30 years. What's the consequence? A million dollars. Um, you know, we could put a value, a dollar value on that. So that, here's that example. I knew I had it in here. Uh, the probability of residents in a higher floodplain from being flooded over their 30 year mortgage, it's about one in four, 25% chance, 26% chance. So we need to think about costs, we need to think about infrastructure, um, how they happen over time, over their whole design life. How much, um, how much time, um, how much money do we have to spend every year repairing that riprap or that bridge or um, rebuilding the bank or something like that? So we have the probability of the hazard over so many years. Here's that one probability. And then the cost of maintaining it each year over time, of adding it up. All right, so now that we've thought about our hazards, let's think about alternatives for our development. We've, we've identified our fluid hazards in, we've done a floodplain map, um, we've got this master plan. What can we do? If we're building a new project, then um, can we minimize the impact? Can we avoid the floodplain? If we're going to build in the floodplain, what does that look like? Are we going to have ongoing maintenance costs or not? Um, if we are going to be making some impacts, do we mitigate that offsite? Meaning I build a floodplain here, then I re restore it over here. Those are some options. There might be some regulatory requirements of that. If it's not new infrastructure, we could relocate. If it's totally wiped out, um, we could replace it where it is. 
we could improve it, try to make it more compatible, um, or remove and just take it out and, and build somewhere else. So there's a lot of options for this. Obviously, on one end of the spectrum, we have build it stout, never doubt, hopefully, with riprap and an armored bank. On the other end, we have our kind of natural or green infrastructure. This is a floodplain that was restored in Fort Collins. Um, former gravel ponds, they filled in the pond a little bit, went in some cottonwoods, took out a levee. And then this was 2014, um, the river came up and we got the flooded floodplain. And so this is storing water in a way that is basically reducing in a little bit, in a small way, the peak of the flood downstream. And we also have options in between. Here is a bank that's probably not gonna move. It's been engineered, so it's got these boulders on the toe, but it's been planted willow. So it still has some kind of um, habitat value, right? So native willow species, but um, we're, we're kind of using the roots of, these, of this wood to keep the bank in place. And then we also are incorporating some rock elements as well. So it's a bit of a hybrid approach. We, we saw this slide earlier. This is kind of a, a big example of what compatible infrastructure could look like. Um, in the urban area, maybe we can have bioengineered banks. Maybe we can take out levees where we don't need them. Um, we can have agriculture and some you know, passive uses like parks and open space and floodplains. Let's try to keep our development out of the floodplain. Just some examples. Here's a bridge that was widened and um, Blood flows can move through the embankments, gives the river a little bit more space and also protects the bridge. All right. So let's think of an example, looking at this picture, let's take a minute, of what is compatible infrastructure, what's incompatible infrastructure. Just kind of based on that introduction. What do you think is working with the river here and what's, what's not working? Yeah. I remember Jen Taylor saying that the Riverside community wasn't working well with the river. It's great right in the floodplain. Right. Yeah, that's a hard one, right? Because you got here's the Riverside community. It's in the floodplain. Um, but are we going to tell these people to move? Probably not. It's their homes. So, like, it's just a lot of people. If these are two homes, maybe you'd be like, hey, here's 500 grand. <laughs> we'll build a nice home somewhere else. Yeah, this is a historic community, right? There's a lot of people who many generations in here. And so this is kind of one of those like entrenched values that, that we kind of think about. All right, how about another incompatible infrastructure? Yeah. Uh, so the one that's close to the last flooding area where the like 500 year floodplain with the early mountains. Yeah. Yeah, those might those might get wet, right? Um, so we do have some development that's in the 500 year floodplain. There's a probability, right? It's a tiny one, but it's still there. 0.2% chance every year. Um, let's see, we've got these gravel ponds, right? This is someone mining. Um, that's a use of land, right? That's totally uh, legal and, and good to do, but then that, uh, it's good to do, but it's just something that people can do. Then we have these levees, right? And so this is kind of a hard point in a really dynamic zone. It's actually creating a bit of a wild situation. I don't know if anyone drafted this, but it's it's kind of uh, a little bit unstable because of this situation. How about compatible infrastructure? Do we think the Riverside Park's compatible? It's pretty compatible. It's in the floodplain. If it floods and gets wiped out, is it the end of the world? We can kind of go back and rebuild a little bit, but it's also kind of made to flow, right? Like it's going to be moving the water through. It's kind of acting like a natural side channel. Um, I'd say that's fairly compatible. This bridge is pretty high, so it's not constricting the floodplain. It starts out high and it ends high. So it's a really great example of allowing the flood flows to move through it. It's not going to have a lot of impacts downstream necessarily. The bike path. The bike path is a little bit offset of the river. Obviously, it gets very close in some areas. And that's problematic. I'd say it's incompatible here, but where we have a little bit of space for the river, it's fairly compatible. 
All right, let's do an example um, real quick, and then I'll have you guys use the last um, about seven minutes of class to think about your own development, your compatible or not development. So this example of kind of planning for change is a plan that was made for Sand Creek uh, that goes through Aurora. Anyone from Aurora to Denver? All right. Anyone down Sand Creek? Just like some parks you got. Um, well, we'll look at it in a second. It's easy to miss, so don't worry. <laughs> Um, Sand Creek is highly urban as it goes through Commerce City here. That's Commerce City and it joins up with the South Platte River. Pretty channelized. This is development that's happened over the last century or so. And as you get out to the east, it's urbanizing. You've got some developments, some parks, um, some farmland still. So it's kind of on this frame. It goes through this transition of more rural to more, this is that baseball fields there, to more urban. And um, a colleague, Katie Yacht, Michael Blazovich, um, developed this where they uh, mapped the fluvial hazard zone for the Mount High Flood District, um, which is the district that manages the floodplains in Denver area, Denver Metro. And they came up, so they did, the, they did that map. Here's the hazard. But what can we do about it? How, does, how can this play out? So they came up with some ideas. Um, let's avoid the fluvial hazard zone with open space easements. So let's pay someone. Um, does anyone know what a conservation easement is? Okay, a conservation easement is you have this property. I pay you for the rights to develop the property. Um, and by paying you, we change the deed and we say this property is not going to be developed for eternity and it's going to stay in this state. There's a lot more details of it, but that's an option. We can pay a property owner. They still own the property, but we basically offset the revenue they would get, the profit they would get from developing it. Um, so that's an option. Obviously, you could buy the property from, pay them for the property, but you have a willing seller. Same for conservation easements. Um, this plan thinks about energy dissipation and sediment storage. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Where we have constrained areas, how can we mitigate the risk there? Do we need to retrofit? and plan for new infrastructure that's going to be more compatible. And then where we do have developments, can we give them incentives to avoid that? I've got a subdivision that's coming in. They want to build 100 homes. Well, I'll let you, um, if you if you agree to do this, instead of building those 10 homes right here in the Fluga Hazard Zone, um, you can build 20 you know, townhomes or something like that, right? a little bit mixed use. So here's what this could look like. Here's um, that rural area. We've got the sand creek that goes right through here. Um, how about let's uh, focus on um, putting some funds towards keeping this as open space. It's a hazardous area, you know, development up on the hill, but let's um, keep this more passive use. So that when that flood does happen, we don't have a lot of damage to infrastructure. Um, where we have, we saw this picture before. So here's the channelized reach coming downstream and then it opens up into this open space. We saw that example for Longmont for Left Hand Creek where you have a, a really channelized reach. The water comes in really fast when it's flooding and it needs an area to release that energy, release that sediment, deposit the sediment out. So let's keep this in open space. This is a really important kind of a long, it's kind of like a pearl, right? along that stream that, that serves that function during floods. Very similar to that park picture that we saw that Carol showed. Let's look at infrastructure. Here's an old bridge. Um, is this culvert? Is this bridge um, tall enough? Is it wide enough? Let's look at that again. Do we need to go in and either um, replace the bridge or provide culverts that can pass water through and under it so we don't get a big backup and blockage and, and take this whole bridge out? Um, because this yellow basically delineates the zone that the river could occupy, the food hazard zone. And this bridge is really teeny tiny right in that way. So looking for opportunities to upgrade infrastructure. All right, so to summarize this idea of kind of planning for change, another way to think about it is urban stream resiliency. So resiliency is being able to bounce back after a flood. That park that we saw in Denver bounced back. How will our community bounce back from the flood? 
but we need to plan for change. That means identifying hazards, doing risk analysis, and developing infrastructure that's going to be more compatible with the river. So here's your assignment for the last um, six minutes that we have. Take out a sheet of paper, you can work with a buddy, and do a little sketch of this. And what I want you to do is pretend that you are um, a Jen Taylor recruiter, all right, or a Sarah Schrader, and you've identified this plot, this property. You've got these gravel ponds. They've mined the gravel out. They're done with them. The city wants to incorporate this as a new feature to connect their community with the river. They through this road of the river north of the highway. The highway's up there. So they've got that great state park, but they want to have another kind of more community focused feature. I'm totally making this up. I don't know if they're thinking about this or not, but maybe they should. We'll see. If you guys come up with some good ideas, maybe they will. So I want you to think about what do you want to put here? What does it look like? We're going to call it Los Lagos, the lakes, because um, that's the theme here. Everything's Las Colonias Dos Rios. Um, what would you plan for this? Where would you, what would you put where? Um, what, what are the hazards that you're thinking about? Um, where is where is the river? Where might the river move over time? Where could we have potentially sensitive habitat? We've got the yellow bill cuckoo. We've got endangered fish. Um, and then what regulations are we thinking about? So do like kind of a sketch of this, and I want you to um, start thinking about what this might look like. Thank you. 